There's a popular book, and it's been written into a play, into a movie called The Diary of Anne Frank. How many of you have read it or seen it? How many of you have, are familiar with that? It's a very intriguing book and play because it gives us insight into the life of a little Jewish girl in the midst of a very troubled time in the Nazi occupation of Germany and other parts of Europe. And um, it's just it's just intriguing to hear what was going on in her mind and in her heart while she was facing this very dark time in the history of our world. As we now come to John chapter 17, we're going to get a similar type of glimpse into the heart and into the mind of Jesus as he is about to face the darkest time of his life on this earth. But he doesn't reveal it to us in a diary. He reveals it to us in a prayer. So I want you to turn with me in your Bibles today as we continue our journey in John and we come to what I am going to entitle the Lord's Prayer. Now I know a lot of you think that the Lord's Prayer is found in Matthew 6 and we call it the Lord's Prayer where his disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I know we call that the Lord's Prayer, but that's actually a misnomer. It should really be called the disciples' prayer. And let me tell you why it can't be the Lord's Prayer. Because in that prayer, he said to pray, Father, forgive us this day of our sins as we forgive others. How many of you know the Bible tells us that Jesus never sinned, right? So we know that can't be the Lord's Prayer, that that's a prayer that he taught us. So this here is, is what is actually the Lord's Prayer. It's also called the High Priestly Prayer of Jesus. Because the high priest in the Old Testament would enter in once a year into the Holy of Holies where he would offer on the Ark of the Covenant a blood sacrifice and he would offer up prayers and intercession for sins on behalf of the nation of Israel. So we see Jesus praying in preparation for him to enter into the Holy of Holies where he would offer his own blood to cover the sins, not only of the nation of Israel, but for the entire world by which we all are saved. Can you say praise the Lord for that? So this is one of the greatest prayers that we have recorded in all of Scripture. And let me make a point here. One of the reasons that it's recorded is because Jesus prayed out loud. Now, I want to make this point because a lot of times when we get our food at the restaurant, we bow our heads and we go. Or maybe if we're praying with somebody in the Walmart parking lot, we kind of pull over to the side. I want to encourage you to begin to be vocal with your prayers. Because Jesus was vocal, not only here, if you go back and you study, the Bible said when he was baptized by John, it said he came up out of the water and praying the Holy Spirit to sit. So he prayed out loud on numerous occasions. And there is something about being vocal in your prayers. And I'm also going to mention something else here. Where was Jesus at when he said this prayer? He was no longer in the upper room because he had told them, let's take our leave. And they weren't in Gethsemane yet because we know that was a different prayer. So Jesus is actually praying this prayer out loud while he is en route. He is walking and talking with the Lord at the same time. So there is, you can walk, you don't have to always be in a prayer closet, kneeling at your bed. You can be walking, you can be driving in your car. And you can be praying. In fact, uh, sometimes you get the greatest looks from people when you're praying in the Holy Ghost going down Interstate 26. I'm telling you. So put it into practice. Be vocal like Jesus did and pray everywhere you go. But this is a very profound prayer. It's simple in its language, yet it's very deep in what he prayed. It was a public prayer. He prayed it in front of his disciples. Yet it was a private conversation that took place between the Father and the Son. And we also find that it expressed several of Christ's concerns in this prayer. He was concerned about the glory of the Father's name. And you're going to hear over and over as you read this chapter how he said, Father, I've glorified your name. And he was concerned about that. He was concerned about the advancement of the kingdom after uh, his death. And he was also concerned about protection from the evil one. Now, in those last two, in order for one to succeed, how many of you know one of those has to fail? Hello? In order for the kingdom of God to advance, the kingdom of darkness has to fail. At least on some level. 
uh, at least in the area in which you live, the, the home which you live in, the neighborhood, the city we live in, if we're going to see the kingdom of God advance, we have to see the kingdom of darkness fail. We have to see it shrink back. And so we see these things in this prayer here. And uh, the prayer can be divided up into three parts. In the first five verses, Jesus prays for himself. Then you're going to notice he prays for his disciples. Then he prays for all believers. Today, I want us just to focus on those first five verses that are found there in chapter 17. And what you're going to see is you're going to see the co-equality between the Father and the Son. You're going to see that Jesus and the Father have one mind and that Jesus actually voices the will of God and that is fulfilling the plan of redemption. From creation until the death upon the cross until the consummation of the ages, God's plan was for redemption, to redeem you and I, to buy us back, to purchase us, to bring us into covenant and fellowship with Him. And you're going to see that being prayed about here in John chapter 17. Let's read those first five verses together. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, The hour has come, glorify your Son, so that your Son also may glorify you. And as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now it's amazing to me that Brother Larry touched on these verses already. He talked about having authority. But he talked about the main thing was to know God and to be known by God. And here's what Jesus says here. Verse 4, I have glorified you on the earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was made. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word, and may God anoint our hearts to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And all the people of God said, Amen and Amen. Now notice that it said that Jesus lifted up his eyes. Now often when we pray, how often do we bow our heads and close our eyes to pray? But Jesus took a different approach when he comes to this prayer. I think it's important for us to notice when all of the time for Jesus to preach is ended. When all of the time for working miracles is over, when all of the time for healing people has finally ceased, Jesus returns to the most important ministry that he had on this earth, and that was the ministry of prayer and intercession. Charles Spurgeon said that he poured out his soul in life before he poured out his soul in death. And here in this prayer, we see Jesus pouring out his soul before the Father. And he lifted up his eyes, the scripture said. He looked up. How many of you know that this term, uh, uh, when you say things are looking up, how many of you know that's a positive term? Well, things have been kind of rough, but they're looking up. And Jesus is showing us that this prayer that he's praying is something that's positive, and it's something where he is looking and fasting his gaze upon the Father. If you go back through the Bible and you look at all the times that somebody lifted up their eyes, you find that lifting up of one's eyes usually precedes something very significant. For instance, Abraham, when he was about to offer Isaac, the Bible said he lifted up his eyes and he saw the ram caught in the thicket. The psalmist said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And John said, lift up your eyes unto the harvest, for the fields are ripe and ready to be harvested. Anytime there's a lifting up of the eyes, it is preceding something significant in the life and the ministry of God. And here Jesus is lifting up his eyes because this is an act of faith, and this is a prayer of victory as he is about to face a great conflict and an hour of great darkness. And you have to remember that in the previous verse, In the previous verse before this chapter, one of the last things Jesus said in that chapter was, he said, I have overcome the world. So he's not now switching gears and moving into defeat, but he is continuing in that line about victory in his prayer. 
What a great model for you and I to follow when we face adversity. When we face adversity, what should our prayer, what is the content of our prayer? Is it one of faith? Is it one of trust? Do we praise and thank God in the midst of adversity? Do we declare victory? Here is Jesus. He's not focused on uh, the, the problems. He's not trying to find a lawyer to represent him for the trial that's about to come. He's not focused on the failure of his disciples to grasp his ideals that he's been teaching them for the last three and a half years. But he has fixed his gaze heavenward and he has pledged his life that he would fulfill the will of God, that he would pay the price and the penalty so that eternal life could be given to all who would call upon his name. And then he says these words. He says, Father, the hour has come. Now I want you to notice that Jesus is declaring the hour has come. If you go back through the book of John, you'll see there were many times where it says, my hour has not yet come. When Mary wanted him to turn the water into wine, he said to her, "Uh, Woman, why are you troubling me? Because my hour has not yet come. It wasn't time for him to be glorified. In John chapter 7, it said they came to arrest him, but they could not because his hour had not yet come. In chapter 8, they wanted to call him in for questioning, but they couldn't find him because his hour had not yet come. But now here is Jesus declaring, Father, now my hour has come. I want you to understand, church, who's calling the shots here. It's not Judas. It's not Jews. It's not the Romans. It's not the devil. Jesus is declaring the events and the timing of his own death. Amen? And I want you to understand that Jesus is in control in the hour of darkness. And you can take that to the bank. This is a father and a son relationally interacting with one another. This is a son talking to a loving father. And when you and I pray, that's the way we should pray. Amen? That we are talking to a loving daddy, Abba, Father. He doesn't pray some ritualistic recitation that's a repeated religious prayer. He doesn't uh, pray some kind of lethargic, liturgical prayer that you read out of a book. He doesn't pray some uh, uh, pious uh, uh, prayer, but he prays from his heart to the very heart of the Father. And what we're reading here is a very interpersonal exchange between the Father and the Son. Now, we know that Jesus was not selfish. Amen? But yet, We find him praying for himself, and he makes one request. He says, Father, glorify your son. Now, you have to understand that this glorification that he's speaking of, it included his death, but it also included his resurrection, and it also included his ascension, and it also included his enthronement uh, at the right hand of the Father. But let us go back and recall, it began with his death. And he's, he, there was a glory that was going to come to God through the death of his son. And here we see Jesus. He knew what laid before him. He knew what was coming before him. And let me say to you, church, if every one of us knew what, what was laying ahead of us, you would do, be doing more of what Jesus is doing right now. We would all be praying more. Here, Jesus, before he goes to the cross... He's wanting to make certain of his identity. He's wanting to make certain of the relationship that he has with the Father. That it's strong. That it's in a right place. That it's in a good place. Because he knows the adversity that is about to hit him. One day as I was jogging, I used to run, but now I jog. Maybe I was running back in the day because it was about 10 years ago. I was running along 171 between the fire station and Charlestown Landing. I heard as plainly as I'm talking to you now, I heard within my mind. I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, you have to keep your body in shape for the work that I have for you to do. And in the same way that we have to keep our bodies in shape or God wanted me to keep my body in shape, can I say to you, you have to keep your emotions in shape if you're going to be in a fit condition to carry out the spiritual ministry that Christ has for you in this hour. Because you're going to be emotionally stressed. You're going to be emotionally tried. You cannot be spiritually whole and be emotionally broken. 
Is it okay if I say that again? You cannot be spiritually whole if you are emotionally broken. There are too many Christians that use Christianity, that use their relationship with God, their love for God, their ministry to others, and even their ministry to God as a cover-up to compensate for something that's missing because they never have dealt with their inner wounds and their inner hurts. But you cannot be an effective witness, and you will not be strong spiritually if you're not whole emotionally. And the same thing can be said mentally. You can't be a good witness if you're not in a good place mentally. You have to be strong in your mind. If you have issues where you're easily offended, you struggle with low self-worth, you have trust issues, you're a, you have that lone wolf type syndrome or the martyrdom complex, everybody is always against me, that victim mentality, you will not be able to be successful spiritually if you have those kind of mental thoughts in your mind. Bill Johnson says you cannot allow to have one thought in your mind that doesn't come from God, that doesn't align with the Word of God. Did you hear me? You can't allow yourself to have one thought in your mind that doesn't align itself with the Word of God. Because if you allow it, it's going to grow and fester into something else. You have to be able to think like heaven if you're going to advance the kingdom of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You have to be in a good place mentally if you're going to be strong spiritually. And so here we find, and let me say, I know somebody that can heal your body. I know somebody that can make you whole emotionally. I know somebody that can set your mind right. Amen? His name is Jesus. Do you know him today? Do you know him on that level where he's gone down and healed all your inner hurts and where he's changed the programming in your mind so that you think like heaven? But here we see Jesus in this prayer. He is aligning himself with the Father. He wants to make sure that everything is right in his his heart, that he knows in his mind, but most of all in his spirit, that he is one with the Father because in the hours that lie ahead, his body is going to be brutalized. His emotions are going to be ransacked as his 11 closest friends will abandon him and he'll be all alone. And even God the Father at one point will have to turn his back on him. And in his mind is going to be harassed because the demons are going to uh, persecute him and torment him and accuse him of every possible thing on the face of the planet. So here is Jesus in a moment of prayer making sure he's right in step with the Father and that he is at peace within himself. That is the call of God upon the church today in the hour that we are in. We need to lift up our eyes and we need to lift up our voice in prayer as never before. Because America, whether you realize it or not, is about to go through some things. It's already begun. The pieces have already begun to fall into place. If you consider COVID to be a plague like I do, I think it's more than just a physical virus. I believe it's a plague. You know, you're really quiet today. I don't know if COVID messed with your emotions or what. I don't know but you guys are really quiet today. Let's, let's pick it up a notch, will you? If not, it's going to be me and the Holy Ghost all the time here. But where was I at? If you consider plague, thank you. If you consider COVID to be a plague, this is what I consider it. I think it's more than just a virus. I think it's a chastening of the Lord. I don't think it's punishment. I think it's a chastening of the Lord trying to shape the minds and the hearts of the church first, but then the nation as a whole. But one of the things that I see with the COVID virus, I see demonic attachments with this virus. There is a spirit of division attached to this virus. It has divided our nation. It has divided families. It has divided churches. It's a spirit And that's why we've got to be real careful when we come to the house of the Lord. And I would even say when you're on Facebook, let it go. Just let it go. Let all the heathens argue over it. 
I'm so tired of reading and talking about COVID. Let's talk about Jesus. Amen? But there's a spirit of division that's attached to this thing. There's a spirit of confusion. It doesn't matter what you say. Somebody else has got something else to say. There's some other study. Somebody says wear a mask. Somebody says don't wear a mask. Somebody says get the vaccine. Somebody, it's just confusion. Confusion everywhere you turn. Let it go. Let the devil have it. Send it back to hell where it came from. And then I'm going to tell you what else I see is attached to it is a spirit of distraction. Think about how much time we have spent as individuals and as a church dealing with COVID when we should have been talking about Jesus and doing the things of the kingdom of God. It's a distraction from the enemy. And you have to recognize the spirit. There's a spirit behind this thing. It's not, I'm not denying that it's not a physical virus, but there's a spirit behind it. And God is trying to get our attention. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You said there's demonic spirits behind it. God uh, didn't, isn't necessarily responsible for it, but God allowed things to happen based on what we wanted in our lives. Yes, he did. You see, God sent the plagues, allowed the plagues to come upon the Egyptians because they thumbed their nose up at God. It's the truth. That's what America's done to God now. Or you can even look at the people of God. Look at Israel. In Jeremiah, you read all through Jeremiah, that Jeremiah was prophesying to them, and they kept rejecting the covenant. They kept rejecting God's word. And so they brought a curse upon themselves and a curse upon the land. So when we reject God, we, we sow to the wind and we reap the whirlwind. And that's part of what you see happening in America. God gives us over to the desires of our heart, and we find ourselves in the state that we're in. Amen? America is unraveling right before our very eyes. Now, I want you to hear me. I am not a fear monger. I am not trying to incite fear in you. The world's doing that enough. And if you're not walking in close fellowship with the Lord, when you begin to hear messages like this, it incites fear in you. But the psalmist said, I will fear no evil. For the Lord is with me. Amen? I'm not a fear monger. I'm trying to make you wise. I am a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare the way of the Lord. God's getting ready to move in this situation, but we as the people of God have to be prepared. Amen? Now let me remind you of the words of John Adams. John Adams was our first vice president, our second president of the United States. He was one of the main framers of the Constitution of the United States of America. And he wrote in this letter to the Massachusetts militia on October the 11th, 1778, these words. And I want to read them to you again. I've used them before, but I want to read them to you again because the words are very prophetic. And he wrote them back in 1778. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled. Does that sound like America? People's passions are unbridled. Are you out there this morning? Hit your neighbor and just say, hey, he's asking for help. Would you say that America is unbridled in her passions? We are unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, now I put these words so you would understand. Avarice or greed, ambition, selfishness, revenge or gallantry, pride, would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Do you want to know why so many people are trying to change the Constitution in America? You don't want to know why we have revisionists, why there are so many cases that are going before the Supreme Court, why they're trying to put so many amendments? It's because we are, have become an amoral and an irreligious society. 
The Constitution was built upon the understanding that our freedoms would work only when our people were self-governing by a moral compass that would be influenced by the Word of God. And regardless of what the revisionists have told you, this country was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. And here we've got plenty of uh, uh, speeches and plenty of language in our history that makes this known. Amen? All the things that God abhors, all the things that God detests, all the things that God says he cannot tolerate, such as greed and sexual perversion, murder of the innocents, pride, lawlessness, injustice, rebellion, idolatry, are running amok in the United States of America. And what's worse is these sins have gained the approval of the institution of our government and the institution of the church. There are very few pulpits in America that are standing up today and crying out against such evils because they're afraid of losing people and losing dollars. But let's declare the truth. Let's let God be true and all else be a liar. If you believe that, somebody say amen and amen and amen. Now I'm going to tell you when the things begin to break loose in this country, people are going to have one of two reactions. Jesus lifted up his eyes and we need to lift our eyes up too. But people are going to have one of two reactions. And there will be on the earth distress of nations and men's hearts failing them from fear. See, there's only two things that get America's attention. It's not the declaration of the word. It's not the truth anymore. You can tell people the truth. You You can take this message and say, you need to hear this message. They say, well, that's your truth, but that's not my truth. Truth doesn't impact Americans anymore. The only two things that impact them is death and when they lose their stuff. Come on now. That's the only time you get to. So guess what? God's already tried death. I'm not saying that God caused the death of all these people because God is loving. I'm just saying that God allowed this plague to come in the hopes that in this chastening, that in the hopes that people would cry out and turn to God, but instead we've, we've, we've turned our nose up at God and, and we've looked to man. We put all of our stock in the vaccine, all of our stock in what man can do. And I'm not against these things. Oh, please, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've been vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated and I've had COVID, okay? So if I spit on you, there's a very low likelihood. I'm not an anti-masker. And let me say this, I'm not afraid. If you see me wearing a mask, I'm not afraid. But I'm not stupid either. I choose to wear a mask. If you choose not to wear a mask, God bless you. I love you. I appreciate your stance and I back up your right to have that choice. Don't put me down for making my choice. Where was I? I've got, I'm, I'm just, I just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God's already tried to get our attention through COVID. And a lot of people have died during COVID, but nobody has turned to the Lord. Nobody has sought repentance. Nobody has come out publicly and said, could this be because of where our nation is at that we're reaping this thing? And I'm going to tell you, apart from a genuine revival, apart from a great awakening in this country, apart from America falling on her knees and repenting before God, you need to understand that something worse is coming down the pipe than COVID. And it's going to impact people's stuff. Because that's the only time you get their attention is when the almighty dollar or their cars, or their homes, or those things go away from them. Well, you don't have to say amen. Thank you, Martha. Me and Martha and the Holy Ghost, we're going to preach this message. Now, some of you are probably saying, what on earth does this have to do with the Lord's Prayer? You've gotten off track. No, listen to me. 
Jesus saw the hour of darkness coming. And so he makes preparation. How does he make preparation for himself? Go out and gather as many swords as you can get. Is that what he did? Does he say, go get all the followers we can to stand on our side because they're going to come a, a rising up against us? Is that what he did? No. What did he do? He went into the prayer closet and he got before his face before God and he lifted up his eyes to the one source that he knew that could get him through the hour of darkness that was coming. And for you and I, you better know the one true source that can get you through the trouble that is coming to this country. You better know the connection you have with your father is a strong one. Hallelujah. Because he is the one that will keep us in the time of trouble. Now give God praise and glory and honor. In the time that's coming, people are going to begin to approach Christians and ask them, does the Bible have anything to say about this? In fact, it's already happening. We've already had uh, Molly, we've already had uh, Linda Gale, different ones uh, have come and asked people in our church, look, does the Bible have anything to say? And we have got to be ready We've got to be ready in that moment to say, yeah, let me take you to Matthew 24, 25, 26. Let me show you. Let me tell you what the Bible says about the times we're in. How many of you know you don't prepare for a football game the day before the game? You don't prepare for a hurricane when they're evacuating the city. How many of you know that? So we have had a season where God is saying, be prepared. And so you've got to prepare your hearts. You've got to get in in, in close communion with the Lord. And when we're ready, when, we, when the church steps into that moment, when we begin to tell people about the Lord instead of worrying about our own selves, then God will be glorified in the earth again. Last week I told you how you can see that things are ramping up in preparation for the mark of the beast. You remember I told you how the vaccine, I'm not saying that the vaccine is the mark of the beast. Don't twist my words. I'm not saying if you took the vaccine that you're serving the Antichrist. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can see how the vaccine and all the requirements and all of the government power that's going with it, you can see how things are ramping up for the mark of the beast. Because already people are being limited. They can't access certain restaurants. Uh, They can't travel to certain nations. There there are certain things you can't do unless you have a valid vaccine and a valid card. So you can see how it's going to be an easy transition where you won't be able to buy food. Where you won't be able to exchange money without having a mark of the beast. A chip or something that's inserted under your skin that means you're a part of a political economic system that is worth worldwide at its time. And that's what's going to happen in the time of the great tribulation period. Now, if we see these things already in place for what's going to happen in the tribulation period, how much closer, church, must we be to the rapture? Amen? Because how many of you know that the rapture precedes, if you studied your Bible, how many of you know the rapture precedes the tribulation period? Unless you're a mid-tribber, and and God bless you if you believe that, or a post-tribber, God bless you if you believe that. I understand some people believe that, but I'm a pre-tribber, and I believe that the the Bible's uh, clear on that. To me, it is that God has not, uh, that God preserves us from the day of wrath. The Bible says that over and over again. You know, when I see the stores putting out Christmas decorations, and how do you know they're putting them out earlier and earlier, Right? Back to school Christmas trees. <laughs> when I see the stores putting out Christmas decorations, I know that Thanksgiving is coming. That's right. Oh, well, Pastor, you mean Christmas is coming? No, no, there's a little holiday that precedes Christmas called Thanksgiving. I, I used to look forward to it pre-COVID. It was a, we got together with Pam's family every year, and it's just a time of being thankful, just being with your family, the blessings of God. It's just a time of reflection and being thankful. I love Thanksgiving. So when I saw the Christmas decorations come out, I knew Thanksgiving was going to be here soon. What am I saying that for? 
when you see the signs of things that are talked about that are going to be a part of the tribulation period happening now, guess what? There's a little event that precedes the tribulation called the rapture, the catching away of the saints of God that we are going to be a part of. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, the day of the Lord, now that, that word day of the Lord means the day of the Lord's wrath, will come like a thief in the night. But God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Somebody say, praise the Lord. I'm going to read it again. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, but God did not appoint us to wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I want to say that I'm not just looking forward to the rapture of the church, but I want to say this. I'm looking forward to a great harvest that's going to come forth in the end times. According to Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 29, it talks about a latter day rain before the day of the Lord's wrath that precedes the Lord's wrath. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to pick a date. I'm not saying it can happen. Uh, I, I don't know when it could be. It could happen in six weeks. It could happen in six months. It could happen in six years. I don't know. We could have many revivals. We could have just one revival. But I believe what America is headed into in the days ahead, you're going to find people that are going to be afraid like they were during 9-11. And when that happens, they're going to have one or two reactions. They're going to, their hearts are going to fail them because of fear. If you look what's already happening, the, uh, the, the CDC said that suicide attempts among adolescents 12 to 17 years old surged more than 50% during the pandemic. Why? Because of hopelessness, because of desperation, because they have no hope. Their eyes are on this world only, and, and, and so they lose hope, and they, uh, the suicide rate. In Japan, we hear that in October of 2020, the suicide rate rose 70% over the previous year. Why? Because they don't know about Jesus. Buddhism is the primary religion. They have no hope. They became desperate and they just off themselves rather than trying to go through the difficulty. Aren't you glad that we have a hope? Aren't you glad that your anchor holds even when the waves of life get high? That you can trust that the rock of your salvation is sure and that your feet are planted on the rock. Is anybody glad about that today? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Don't be shaken. But if we're already seeing these things, if we're already seeing people's hearts uh, failing them because of fear, what is it going to be like when America begins to get shaken in the days ahead? People, we've got to lift up our eyes because there will be another reaction that takes place. Some will become fearful and fall away, but there are some that are going to turn to the Lord. Here's the good news. You heard the bad news. Here's the good news. People are going to begin to turn to the Lord. They're going to be coming to you as a Christian if you let your light shine. Now, if you're afraid, if you're walking around all the time, if your neighbors hear you talking about how bad it's gotten, oh, God, what are we going to do? I'm out of toilet paper. Oh, my Lord, this is the worst thing. I don't know. If that's what's coming out of your mouth, guess what? They're not going to ask you jack squat. I'm serious. This is why we have to have the joy of the Lord as our strength. This is why we have to be in close fellowship with the Lord. This is why we got to make sure the connection is strong. It's not about hoarding up stuff. Now, if God tells you to stock up, stock up. Do what you feel led to do. But that's not going to get you through these troublesome times. It's your walk with the Lord. And in these times, people are going to begin to turn to true Christians whose light has been shining, who've been demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit and the love of God. And they're going to want to know, tell me about your God. Tell me what's happening in this time. And, the, and, and, and those that have that deep fellowship with the Lord, those that have that walk of faith, you are going to see a lot of people come to know Christ. If you don't know that, 
You're going to get swept up in the pandemonium that's happening in this world. Jesus said, I tell you these things in advance so that you will not be made to stumble. But in that hour, it will be the church's greatest time to shine. And just as Jesus prayed, Father, glorify your son. We should be praying right now that when the adversity comes, God, let the glory of God return to the church once again. Let us shine forth your light and let people come to the light of your shining in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Jesus said, I have authority over all flesh. Now what a contrast. He's saying the majestic splendor and the dominion of the kingdom of God contrasted to the weakness and the frailty of man. He says, I have authority over all flesh. And it's talking about man in a sinful fallen state. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus said all humans are subject to him. Every knee is going to bow. And this verse of Scripture reminds us, again, I want to emphasize this, that Jesus is in control. Amen? Not the POTUS, not the Pope, not the pandemic, not principalities and powers. Jesus is in control. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now, you better take a Sharpie, some of you, and write this on your forehead. Because if you don't have this depth in prayer, if you don't have this fellowship and this communion with God, when things start going haywire, you're going to forget. You need to remember, Jesus is in control. All authority, he said, both in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And then he said, I have given you authority, as Brother Larry said, to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers. Jesus is in control. Let me jump ahead. Jesus prayed this prayer. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me. How many of you know that the Father honored the prayer of Jesus? Amen. God knows how to keep those that belong to him. You are in safe keeping. You are in good hands with Jesus and the Father. Amen? Then he says in the next verse of Scripture, verse 3, that they may know you and that they may know Jesus Christ. Now, this is a title. He's not saying that they might know my name, that they might know that I am the Messiah, the Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. That word know there is written in the progressive tense. You don't say, I came to know Christ when I was 17 years old. You're still trying to know him. Amen? You're still learning about it. It's a progressive, growing relationship that we have with the Lord until the day we die. But do you know him today? That word to know, you don't have to guess. We were at an encounter uh, uh, someplace, and I I just went around and asked a person if if they knew that they were saved. And there was one young man who said, well, I, 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 I think so. I, I, I prayed the prayer. Listen, you either know you're saved or you're not. There's no hemming and hawing with this thing. Amen? There's no wiggle room. You either know Jesus, you know you're saved, you know he's in your heart or not. It's not like I, 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 I prayed the prayer. I mean, I, you, no! Do you know him? This is not speculative. This is a practical thing. Oh, sorry. Take me back. It's not a theory. It's an experiential thing. You experience this thing firsthand for yourself. Amen? It's not intellectual. It's not a head knowledge. It's not having facts. It's a spiritual experience. And it's not inactive. But it's alive. It's alive! (laughs) When you give your heart to Christ and He comes to live inside you, it makes a difference. You just didn't pray a little sinner's prayer. Now, well, yeah, I think I'm a Christian. Yeah. No! He's now taken up residence inside of you. This thing is alive. Amen? Either you know Him or you don't. And what you know is that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the anointed one. John only uses that word Jesus Christ twice in his book. Then in verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on the earth and have finished the work. Jesus glorified the Father because he represented the Father well. 
So how do we glorify the Father? By representing Him well. So let me ask you, do people know you're a Christian because you had to tell them you were a Christian? Or do they know a Christian because of the way you treat your neighbor? Do they know you're a Christian by the language that comes out of your mouth? Do they know that you're a, a Christian because you're a loving individual? Without ever having to say it, they know that there's something different about you. So that when the moment comes, they know that you're a Christian. Amen? Let's represent the Father well. But then he said, I have finished the work that you had for me to do. You know, when we travel on missions trips, I see something that happens a lot, especially as we go through Panama, and I see where people have started to build a house. And maybe they'll have a foundation, and they might have the corner pillars up. Maybe they've even got some of the walls, and then there's just vines growing all in the thing. It's dust-laden. You can tell it's not going to get finished. And it just saddens me. And I, it goes through my mind, I wonder what happened. Did they run out of money? Did the person die? It's so sad to start something and not finish it. I don't know why, but that bothers me. It's sad to me. But Jesus said, I have finished the work you sent me to do. I have finished the plan of redemption. And when he was on the cross, he uttered these words, Telestai, it is finished. It means in the Greek, it is paid in full. The purchase has been complete. I have paid the price for my people in my own blood. I want you to know, church, that Jesus is a finisher. And whatever he starts, he will finish. And he that began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion in Christ Jesus. I don't care where you're at today spiritually. God has a work for you. God has a call upon your life. And if you will allow it, he will finish. Finish that work in your life. Amen. amen and amen. Jesus understood that work of redemption. Even at his birth, he understood for this cause, he's, I was born, he said, and have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. He understood it when he was just a preteen, before he was even 13 years old. He told his mom and dad, I must be about my father's business. And he knew it when he was on the cross dying. He said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He knew that he was going to finish the work he started. This thing started on his timetable. The hour has come, and it's going to end on his timetable. Amen? Did I tell you already that Jesus is in control? Did I mention that? Well, why don't you look and tell your neighbor Jesus is in control? Amen. Then he says, Lord, let me return to the glory that I had with you in the beginning. That word in the Greek means that I had when I was at your side, that I had when I was in your presence. Jesus left his body in a weak and broken state, but he left this earth in a glorified supernatural body. Amen? And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father where he is glorified. When he left this earth, he left with just a small gathering of his followers but when he comes back, every eye on the earth is going to see him. When he left this earth, there was only two angels that came down and acknowledged. But when he comes back, I want you to know he's coming back on a white stallion. And all of the host of heaven is going to be behind him. Hallelujah. When Jesus left this earth, he left in just his normal attire. Whatever he was wearing, his robe. But when he comes back, the Bible said he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written nobody else knows. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. We're going to see the one that the psalmist in 24 said. We will see the king of glory coming back to rule and to reign upon this earth. Amen. If you believe it, stand to your feet with me today. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. God bless you.